Welcome again. Uh, this is another session. In this session, we're going to concentrate on fractures of the radial neck and the olecranon. Now, these are kind of small fractures, and but they can have big problems associated with them. So we're going to go through a lot of the detail. There's not a lot written about these fractures. If you look at it in the textbooks, there's not a lot in there about these fractures of treatment. So uh, I thought I'd go over here my experience with these and some of the problems that we've had. Let's first look at radial neck fractures. Most of the fractures are in the neck. Why is that? The weakest part of the bone. That's right. That's, that is the metaphyseal bone. It's weaker. And in the child, there's a lot of car uh, cartilage in the head, so it can absorb the the pressures that are put on it, but the metaphysis is the weaker part. So almost all of these are metaphyseal fractures, and we're going to pretty much concentrate on metaphyseal fractures because that's what most of them are. Very rarely do we see head fractures, and I'll show you some of the problems that occur when we have head fractures. So, you know, first you really have to have a little knowledge about proximal, how it ossifies. And also, there's some other anatomical considerations that you need to learn. First, let's look at the ossification process. In the pre-ossification, actually the metaphysis is kind of angulated a little bit, and I've seen situations where they was interpreted as a fracture. Uh, the secondary center of the radial head, there's no ossification. And the border of the metaphysis is kind of oblique here, and sometimes they can say can think this might be kind of a, a torus fracture. So you have to consider that's the normal variation of the metaphysis. So let's look at the ossification process. When does the radial head begin to ossify? At three years old. That's right, about three or four years of age. And here's one, this patient was four years of age, and we took this x-ray later, and you see that that ossification will go actually up to about six years of age, seven years of age before it's fully ossified. And sometimes there's a bipartite ossification center, and I'll show you in a few minutes how that can give you, lead you astray. Now there's another anatomical consideration. How does translocation affect radial head function? You remember that this is a very congruous joint, and that it's totally congruent. And so the, when you do rotation, you have full rotation because it fits. Uh, it doesn't have any offset or anything like this, and it fits. And you have equal rotation in supination and pronation. But if you have a fracture and you have it translocated, it gets translocated, what happens? What effect do you call this? Do you know? No, sir. Yeah, this is the cam effect. It produces a cam, and what it does is that it changes the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation of the proximal uh, ulna is different than the radial head, and so you have, it'll go a long ways this way, but in going in this way, it's impeded because it's offset a little bit. So you need to make sure that you have corrected not only angulation, but translocation as well. Now, we always want to worry about or concern what's the mechanism of, of, of radial neck fractures. And it can occur in one of two events. It can be primary when it's the only injury, and you'll see it as an isolated injury. There may be some soft tissue involvement, but it really is the, the fracture component is, is pretty much isolated. The secondary is part of another fracture or joint dislocation complex injury. So let's look at this. This is, what is the usual cause of these, primary cause of these fractures? Uh, fall with the arm and extension. That's right, very good. It's they fall with their arm and extension. They use the arm to, and it's usually the non-dominant arm that they use because they're using their dominant arm to try to uh, catch themselves. And they'll put their arm in extension to kind of break the fall. They don't break the fall, they break the elbow. And most children have a valgus carrying angle of how many degrees normal? About seven degrees? Well, maybe a little bit more. About 15 is the average. And so how does that affect the mechanism of these injuries? 
it, it pushes, uh, st it stresses that um, uh, radio carp uh, radio um, uh, capitella. Yeah, so. right. That's very good. So when they fall on the extended elbow, if they've got a carrying angle in the, with the valgus alignment, that comp p puts a concentration, compressive forces uh, laterally. And as we'll see, most of these fractures are failure and compression. Now, there are some fractures that occur secondarily as part of a combined fracture complex. Now, look at this one. This one that we discussed the other day, and what do you see here? You have posterior angulation of the ulna, and what else? Is there, there's a fracture of the radial neck, right? Yes, sir. Okay, you look at it a little bit closer, and it's a complete fracture, but notice that the, there's posterior lateral displacement of the proximal ulna. If we get an AP view and look at it a little bit closer, you can see that it's a complete fracture. And here you can see the posterior lateral displacement. And then there's, of course, a complete fracture of the radial neck. So this is a type 2 Montasia lesion. Remember when we talked about Montasias, that often the type 2s are involved fractures of the radial neck in addition to a fracture of the uh, olecranon. And so a lot of times, it's very important. People will look at the fracture of the radial neck and, and really focus on it when the probably the most important one, as we'll talk about later, is of course the uh, angulation of the proximal radius, I mean ulna. Now they can also occur secondarily with a dislocation of the elbow. And here's one in which the elbow dislocated and the radial head fractured and here you can see this displaced radial head, and we're going to talk a little bit more detail about this. And this injury complex we'll talk about a little bit more. So, how do you classify radial neck fractures? We always like to use classification because it tells you three things. What are they? The amount of angulation. Well, the structure of the of the uh, fracture, the the treatment and the possible complications. Those are the three things. That's why it's important to know classification. First, in what general manner can you classify fractures of the radial neck? Well, some of them, most of them occur acutely. But there are some, and we'll discuss when that can occur laterally, I mean, chronically. But we're going to really, initially, we're going to pretty well focus mainly on the acute injuries. You rarely do you see the the chronic injuries. So, we classify them based upon the position of the fracture fragments. So, how can you classify them that, that way? Uh, for the metaphyseal or the epiphyseal? Well, to some degree, yes. What you do acutely, the radial neck fractures can be grouped into two main patterns based upon the relationship of the radial head and the proximal radius. So in some, most of them, it's the primary displacement of the radial head. And these are usually the, the, the isolated radial neck fractures. And you can also have the radial head not be displaced, but the distal portion is displaced, the metaphysis and diaphysis. So let's look at the primary displacement of the head. This is one here where the head is displaced, the uh, radial capitellar joint is no longer aligned, and certainly the proximal ulna and the uh, ulna shaft and the metaphysis and the radial head is no longer aligned. Now, this is a second less common acute displacement pattern. And what do you see here? Where is the radial head? Well, we'll magnify it a little bit. But notice that the radial head is, is still in the orbicular ligament. So what's been displaced here? The distal, ulna. The yeah, the ulna has been displaced. And so it's a primary displacement of the neck and shaft. And of course, we talked about this, this is something that you need to focus on as well. So the radial head remains within the anterior, the anterior ligament. And the radial capitellar alignment actually has been maintained. This is usually uh, uh, rare, but you need to understand that here you really need to focus on the, the ulna and get it reduced and usually the radial head will go back and uh, realign once you get the ulna reduced. So the shaft segment is displaced medially. So 
There are also chronic injuries. When do you, in what situation do you think you would see chronic injuries? Uh, missed Montasia? Well, that's, they're usually not a fracture, but there is a, a number two, a type two, but, but. Oh, uh, pitcher's elbow or? Yeah, right, in pitcher's elbow, because with a, with a pitcher, if they're, especially if they're throwing sidearm and throwing curveballs, they're putting a, a lateral compressive, repetitive, a lateral compressive stress on them. And I've seen situations in which the father wanted to make his son the best pitcher in the world, so he got him out and made him pitch <coughs> excessively. And that's why nowadays there are certain limits as the amount that you can pitch. So you can get actually stress fractures from that. You can get it from that or from gymnasts that you see. And here's two examples. Uh, the chronic stress in the baseball pitchers. One it involved really mainly the radial head, the articular surface, and the other you can see that was a stress fracture mainly of the metaphysis. We don't see these very often. Uh, these are just a few rare exceptions that I've seen in my orthopedic career. Now, there's two types of head displacement. Into what are they related? Uh, it's related to the epiphysis, so it's the type of salt. Well, it's related to the mechanism of injury. And what's the most common displacement pattern? You told me how the, the injury occurs was how? That kid falls on... Arm extended. Yeah. So what's going to be the, the failure mechanism? Uh, lateral compression. Lateral. Yeah, right. So the most common one that we see is this valgus compression fracture pattern in which the failure occurs where? Laterally. Yes, but in, we're in the, in, the, uh, in the radius, in the metaphysis, you know, because that's weak, thin bone. And so you can have just pure angulation, which is a valgus force, or you can have, actually you can have it somewhat complete and it can be actually translocated, or it may be completely displaced, as you can see here. And often when you have this, you often have both angulation and translocation that you need to look at. And remember, uh, translocation can probably give you more loss of motion than, than angulation. So the mechanism of this type, of course, is our patient here that fell off the, the horse and applied an extended upper extremity with a valgus force. Now, there are other associated injuries that can occur with valgus injuries. And what are they? Uh, MCL injuries or medial, medial Well, yeah, in children there's not so much MCL. The, 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 the adults, uh, their bone is stronger, but in children their bone is metaphyseal, weaker. So the failure is usually in the bone or through the, excuse me, through the physis. And so what you look for, you can get avulsions it's a valgus stress, you can get actually avulsion excuse me, the medial epicondyle, or you can put a bending force on the weak olecranon and you'll get a green stick fracture of the olecranon. And here's a good example. Here's a patient, you see the focus is on the radial head, but also this patient has a green stick fracture of the olecranon. And that's very important that you recognize that because he, just like in Montasia fractures, what do you have to correct? The ulna. You need to make sure if you don't get a good correction of the ulna, you're going to have difficulty in getting a good correction of the radial neck fracture. Now there's a less common head displacement pattern, and these are usually associated with elbow dislocations, as we can see here. So when in the dislocation mechanism can they occur? Um, well, they can occur during the dislocation, okay. and when else? Um, I guess on the spontaneous reduction or That's the right. reduction. That's right, very good, um, yeah, they can occur. A lot of elbows are, you, you'll hit the history is they had a popping sensation and then they moved it around and it popped again. And a lot of times uh, the elbow will be uh, reduced spontaneously or the trainer will go out there and reduce it. So there's a characteristic though as to when these fractures occur during dislocation. So what happens? Well, during dislocation, what hits the radial head? The distal humerus. Yeah, the capitellum hits the radial head and pushes it 
forward here. And so if it occurred during dislocation, usually then the head has been popped anteriorly. Now, and this is a good example. This probably occurred, we probably would recommend that it occurred during the dislocation process. As you can see, it's popped anterior, the head's lying anterior. Now, what happens if it goes during the reduction? What hits, what causes the re reduction? What causes the fracture? Probably under the capitulum as well. That's right, that's right. It comes back as it's coming back, the radial head hits the capitellum and it's then pushed backwards, goes backwards, and so it lies <coughs> posterior to the long axis of the proximal ulna. And here's a good example. This one probably occurred during, looks like it occurred during the process of reduction. Although if you look real closely, this one hadn't been fully reduced yet. But you can see that it was back here posteriorly. Now, we've looked at the classification and the mechanism. Now we need to think about treatment. So other than the fracture itself, what other factors do you need to be addressed during the outcome? Uh, you need to look at angulation, yeah. displacement. But we're, that's the fracture. We're talking about anything else besides the fracture. Oh, soft tissue injury? That's right. There's usually a lot of soft tissue injury associated with this, and it's unappreciated. If you have a lot of soft tissue injury, what can that lead to? Stiffness. That's right. So, they, you know, that sometimes is unappreciated. So you need to tell them beforehand what? Uh, that there's a possibility it's going to have a bad outcome or it's going to do Well, that's right. That you need to warn beforehand. Even though this is a small bone and a small fracture, they may lose some motion, but they'll usually have a continue, they'll, they'll maintain a functional range of motion, which we said is how much? How much motion do you need to have, supination and pronation? 40? 40 or 50, that's right. So what two factors need to be considered in determining the acceptable limits before you need to treat it? Well, you consider both the angulation, and what's the other thing that occurs? Translation. That's right, very good. So you have to look at both the angulation and the translocation. So, how does angulation affect treatment? What are the criteria you use for angulation? Well, if it's just 30 degrees. If it's less than 30, that's acceptable. That's right. You, you probably don't need to do anything. It's probably within the limits. And there is a little bit of remodeling that can occur in the younger child. If it's 30 to 60. Then you should try to reduce. That's right. And it usually responds, these usually respond to closed reduction. What if it's greater than 60? Should open, open reduction. Well, so. you may, you can try a closed reduction, but it, it's, there's a higher chance that this is gonna require a surgical intervention. Okay, so again, how does translocation affect the result? Their range of motion. That's right. Remember, we talk about this. Remember, it's totally congruent. And if you have translocation, then that produces this cam effect, and then she'll lose range of motion. Now, fortunately, about three millimeters of translocation can be expected to remodel. And here's a good example. This one's not, this one's still pretty well aligned, and after uh, three months, it was fully remodeled. So if it's just minimal translocation, you can expect that you can get some remodeling. Um, now, if the radio, if you get a look at it in the emergency room and the radiological indications are not really clear, you're a little, what would you do to determine? I get an orthogram? That's right, well, the next step is you want to examine them clinically, and you want to determine their true radio rotation. And you can do this, you can do under sedation, with or an intraarticular injection. You can put a little, uh, aspirate the hematoma and put a little uh, local anesthesia. Or a lot of times, it's maybe best to do general anesthesia because you may need to be a little bit more aggressive in your treatment. But what you want to check is see what the rotation alignment is with the present reduction. When you need to know whether you need to improve that to get better rotation. So, again, what's the acceptable limit of forearm rotation? It's about 40 to 50. Yeah, about 50 degrees of supination and pronation. The people can be pretty well functional. 
Now, for angulated or trans or translocated fractures, what should you try first? The um, closed reduction, manipulating. Yeah. You try that first and see what happens. Now, if you're going to understand the manipulative techniques, you need to understand a little bit of the pathology, and the pathology and the displacement is dependent upon what force is. Uh, the direction of the dislocation? Yeah, well also the muscles to you know, to affect you. did. You have to have understanding of the pathology and what are the major muscles that are attached to that distal fragment? The biceps? That's right, the biceps. It pulls it proximal and ulnarward. And the supinator then pulls it this way. So this is the this is the pathology that you have that you're dealing with. Now, years ago, all the textbooks talked about this was popularized by an orthopedic surgeon, I believe he was in England, and he had this classic manipulation technique. And this is what I used for years. And there's a little bit of problem. One, it's a two person technique. The assistant holds the counter-traction proximally and applies medial to lateral pressure. The surgeon applies distal traction and with the forearm supinated, and then with the other arm he applies direct pressure on the radial head. And then uh, at the same time a various moments applied, supposedly you open it up and you can push that radial head in there open that up and during this manipulation the forearm is rotated to make sure that the heads that you can push on when you get the head in most of the thing. But what do you think is the problem with this? Have you ever done this? Mm -mm, what do you think would be the problem? A lot of moving parts. Well that's right, there's a lot of moving parts but what's happened at the fracture site? Well there's going to be a lot of swelling, this has been my experience, and it's a little bit, there's usually a lot of swelling there and, and it's been a little bit difficult to find and feel that radial head because of the local swelling. So I've not found this to be a very uh, uh, effective method. If it's minimally displaced, you might try it first. But this is the one technique, and this was popularized by an orthopedic surgeon, Kaufman, in Israel, so I call it the Israeli technique. And it involves manipulating the elbow, not in extension, but in flexion. Now, uh, it's most effective, and most of the time when they come in, they're stuck in supination and they lose pronation. If the forearm's already in pronation, it's probably not going to be very effective. But the manipulation may not be effective. And so how does it work? Well, what you do is you put the elbow in 90 degrees, elbow at 90 degrees of flexion. And I'm not sure that's that important, but that's the best way to get the rotation. And you put direct pressure over the radial head. Again, I'm not sure that that's important. I think it's the rotation component that does it. And so then you, they're stuck in supination and you put it in uh, pronation and you'll feel some resistance and all of a sudden it'll pop in. And so the form is then rotated into full pronation. And when you do that, you're pretty well, uh, that you've got it pretty well reduced. And so what happens? How does it affect the reduction? Well, in supination, there's usually a gap between the radial, the head and the neck. And here you can see this gap that occurs. And when you rotate it, what does it do? It closes that gap. That usually is good. As you can see it like this. Now, does it work? Yeah. Actually, I learned this uh, I saw this technique first by a resident in the emergency room. He said all I did was just rotate the form and this way and got it this way, got it reduced. And so we started doing this years ago and then Kaufman came out with his article like this. Now, you know, I've, I find that even if you've got it completely displaced, it's worth a try. This is a patient that was a gymnast uh, she had fallen from the rings, and you can you would agree that she's got complete displacement of the head like this. And so we put her to sleep, and I thought, well, let me try the Israeli technique before we open it or put a pin in there to manipulate it. And so we did, and I felt this pop, 
and she had reduced. This little fragment here it was a free fragment and she just gradually absorbed it. It probably came from the metaphysis, but she came out with a essentially normal range of motion. So, if it's even if it's markedly displaced, and I'll show some other examples, it's worth a try. A lot of times it will you you'll be surprised at how good it does. Here's the post-reduction Israeli technique. Said satisfactory reduction was achieved. Now, what do we have here? That looks like a Montasia. That's right. But everybody's focused on the radial head. Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. The ulnar fracture pattern, what do we see? It's a posterior apex. That's right. Yeah, it's posterior apex. Okay. And so, Type 2. So what's it? it it's, yeah, really. Again, you need to look, if it's a complex injury, you need to look at the other injuries. And with a display, radial neck fracture represents a type 2 Montasia lesion. So, how are you going to reduce this one? Remember? Bring the ulna, fix the ulna first. And how are you going to do that? Uh, uh, traction and, ex and extension. That's right, very good. You, this is one that you can reduce and maintain an extension. And what you do, you focus on the ulna, and what happens? When you do that, the radial head spontaneously reduces in extension. So the ulna is now reduced, and the radial neck is also reduced. And here again, it's important that you focus to get the radial neck to reduce, just like in the Montasia, you have to reduce the ulna first, make sure it's completely reduced. So. There's a fracture of the radial neck. Always check for associated other injuries. Now, we place this patient in a long arm cast and extension. You can see that it's aligned. And here's this patient six weeks and it's healed with full range of motion. Now, this is what you want to avoid. And this looks very good. This is a patient that had a classification of this fracture, completely displaced radial neck fracture. And when did this occur with the radial neck, radial head posteriorly. That was during the reduction. That's the right. It probably associated with the dislocation of the elbow, and it probably occurred during the reduction of the elbow. So your next step is to what? Well, you want to reduce the elbow. Yeah. So you did. Look at here. How does that look? Looks okay? Yes, You're going to accept that? Uh, better look real closely. More than 30 degrees angulated. Well, yeah, it's not that. But 30 degrees you can accept. There's interarticular piece. Oh, there, will they accept this reduction? Is there something strange about the placement of the radial head? Oh, it's flipped. Oh, it's huh? It's flipped. <laughs> yeah, it's flipped. Very good, very good. And this is not always, so it's not going to heal, is it, very well? <laughs> in that position. Maybe not. Yeah, that's very good. So you look at it. You see the alignment, but look at the articular surface. And he was pinned, but he didn't do very good, and so they had to turn, open it up and completely fix it. So the radial head was upside down uh, on this. Although it looks like it's well aligned, always check and see and make sure it's not 100 degrees. So, are there any other techniques you want to try before an invasive procedure? The one with the S mark. That's right. You know, if at first you don't succeed, you try some other tricks. You keep them doing a reduction. And I learned this uh, by experience. I had a patient that I thought we were going to operate on, and to exsanguinate the arm, I wrapped it real tight with an ace wrap. And that wrapped it real tight. And here was the fracture. This was the best reduction we could get by manipulative techniques. And we had the patient asleep, and we were prepared to do a percutaneous or an open reduction. So I wrapped it real well, and look at here. So okay. always take an x-ray before you make your incision after you apply this. There is an article in the literature years ago about this technique, but this is a lesson that you need to learn when you apply the ACE wrap. So an anatomic reduction was achieved with the elastic rubber and loam. Now, after the non-invasive techniques have tried, what are you going to do? At that point, you would open it. Well, you're going to try invasive techniques. Yeah. You have to put them to sleep. You're not going to do this in the emergency room. Right. So, you want to consider surgical intervention. So, what are the two categories of surgical procedure? Pre-op 
reduction? Well, that's right. One is minimally invasive. Nowadays, with image intensifiers in our society, where everybody pretty well has an image intensifier, so that has enabled us to use minimally invasive or percutaneous techniques, or if that doesn't work, then you can do an open reduction. Now, there's two ways in which the fracture can be reduced percutaneously. You can do it by direct external pressure, or you can do it internally with an intermedullary approach. So, in performing a direct percutaneous procedure, how should the forearm be positioned? In pronation? Yeah, why is that? You need to put them in pronation, why is that? What's right here by that radio, right there? Oh, the PIN? Yeah, so you, that way by putting them in pronation, you move the radial nerve out of the way so that you're not sticking your manipulated device through the radial nerve. So you try to do it with the forearm in pronation and to decrease the risk of injury to the posterior interosseous nerve. And so there's many uh, devices, Steinman pin, an owl, surgical elevator. Here's one in which we had this. This was the best we could do by manipulation. And so we put an owl, owl there and pushed on it and sometimes that's a little difficult to feel that. You, you really have to do it by the image intensifier. And you can see it, and you can push it back. A non-operative film, satisfactory alignment. This is one where one of my associates did this, and he used a surgical elevator, made a little small incision, used a freer elevator, and then pushed it up like this. Satisfactory alignment was achieved. Now. This is the other procedure, and this is very popular in Europe, and this is the Metazo technique that was popularized by Dr. Metazo, who was a very prominent orthopedic surgeon in France. And it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's something that you need to have in your armamentarium, uh, and it's very popular in, in Europe. They use it a lot in Europe. So the pin is passed proximally up the shaft, and then once it's up the shaft, you you apply a little bit of traction to kind of distract it, uh, facilitate to distract it, and then you pass it up into the head. And once you get it up into the head, you can rotate. It's got a little curve, and you can get your final reduction. The key is though, you got to have it enough that you can grab and get your get your pin in, in, entered into that. So sometimes you have to do some other things, like in this one. So the metazo technique, what you really need to do here, there's not enough room to get that uh, rod into the head. So sometimes you have to kind of give it a little push. The tip of the intermediary nail is passed up to the fracture site. And sometimes you have to kind of push it over so that you have enough of the diameter that you can then pass it into the head. So you pass it over like this. And once you do it then, use a joystick to place the head where it can be grabbed by the nail, then you can pass it into the head. And as we see here, one of the things that is that sometimes if you have a blunt pin, it's hard to get it through that physis, and you want to try to get it through the physis. So you pass it into the head to secure it. Now, here's a six-year-old fell off the monkey bars, didn't come in till the next day, was seen in the pediatric emergency room, swollen left elbow, you got the x-rays, what's your assessment? What are you gonna call and tell me? You're in the emergency room, I'm a staff on call. I would say that there's a six-year-old um, with it appears to be a posterior lateral elbow dislocation with uh, a radial head fracture. Um, yeah, a radial neck fracture. Radial really. neck fracture. And what else? Uh, the olecranon. Yeah, there's a fracture of the olecranon. So, you assess this, and you're gonna, you're gonna, you think you need to operate on this? Uh, it looks completely displaced. Yeah, I yeah. So where's the radial head? The radial head is way over here. It's completely displaced, uh, or the radial neck, and there's the edge of the radial neck. And so, of course, we have this injury as well. So what's your next step? You're gonna put him to sleep, and what's the first thing you're gonna do? Uh, check the range of motion? Well, you know the range of motion is not going to be very good. If I attempt a close reduction. I and mean, how? What technique are you going to use? Um, well, remember, 
The orthogram may give you a little bit more information. It shows that the, actually the radial head is still pretty well reduced. So the displacement is really mostly in the ulna, as you can see, but the radial head is pretty well reduced, so it's pretty stable. Lateral view doesn't tell you much. Your next step was you're going to do an open reduction, percutaneous manipulation, or a closed reduction with what? Well, we use the Israeli technique. Again, even if it's that badly displaced, give it a try. So, we did. And what did we get? Reduced. Is that acceptable alignment? Yes. Well, it's still a bit translocated. So how are you going to correct that? Well, we were able to get it close to a translocated position. And we can make that a little bit better by what? Well, you do this metazole, and here you can put it into the head, and then you rotate it, and you correct that translocation with the metazole technique. And here again, <clears throat> unfortunately, this one radial head was completely off and became avascular. And that's something you need to tell the parents ahead of time. If it's completely off, that the circulation to that is kind of tenuous, and you can get a vascularity. And one of the tips is, if you use a, a, a smooth pin, it's a little hard to get it to penetrate. So you need to make a little, make it sharp. And that's one thing they don't tell you in the textbook, that you, but you need to make it a little bit sharp so that it'll penetrate that physeal cartilage and you can get it into the epiphysis. So you need to sharpen it so it'll penetrate the physis into the head. So once you've got non-operative methods and percutaneous techniques, what needs to be considered? Well, in open reduction, you've tried that percutaneous, so then you do an open reduction, and what do you want to say? About the soft tissue injury? Yeah. Can you really make it better? You know, you're going to put a scar on this patient. You're going to create more soft tissue injury. Can you make it better? Well, here's an indication for primary open reduction. This one probably occurred post elbow dislocation. This occurred during the dislocation because it's anterior mechanism, probably during the dislocation, popped off like that. And then a lot of times you, you can make a little incision and the alignment's now anatomic. And so sometimes, sometimes an open reduction is less traumatic than doing a lot of punching and trying to do a lot of percutaneous techniques. So an open reduction, how are you going to fix it? With the intramedullary nail? Yeah, right. Often, once, often though, a lot of times the fragment may be stable and you don't need to do anything. But if not, you can do this. No? You're shaking your head? No. That makes it pretty stable. You're not going to do that? It's stable, but they have a risk of AVN of the capitellum. Well, is that, is that caused by the pin? Uh, I think it's because you violated the posterior part of the capitellum. Yeah, well, yeah, you're right. There is some cause there, but that's really not the, the, the real problem. This was done by a, a colleague of mine, and he called me because he said, I did this, I got a good reduction to put the pin in, but when I pulled the pin out, oh, <laughs> it's still in there. So fortunately, it broke off right at the, just under the surface of the uh, cartilage, and this child still has this pin. It's probably, this, I don't know, this child was about eight years old and that pin is probably about an approximate third. He still has that pin in there. But the, you know, the articular surface doesn't touch the capitellum until the last bit of flexion. And we did an orthogram and found that it was not impinging on it, and so we left it alone. If fixing is needed, you really need to put your pin obliquely so that you can take it out and it's easy to remove. Now, what's your assessment of this patient's? That looks like the radial head. Yeah, that looks like, well, the radial head may be fractured. That's right. And it's posteriorly displaced, so yeah. it's likely during the reduction. Yeah, so it probably occurred during the reduction. Can you do a closed reduction on this? You can try, but you're not going to get very far. So what do you have to be prepared to do? Uh, open the joint. That's right. 
You open the joint, what kind of type occurred during the reduction. So you open it, uh-oh, what do you got? What kind of fracture is this? Uh, That's a Salter Harris three fracture. Yeah. So, and it's a head, which is rare. As we said, remember, most of the time, it's just the neck, but you got the head. So you got a Salter Harris three fracture. How are you going to fix it? Well, you can put some little tiny screws across it and get it that way, or you can put some pins that you want to put across it. But usually it's, you can use a real small micro screws and put it in there. The only problem is that sometimes they'll get kind of bother them later on and you have to come back and just take the screw out. And this is a transepipsial screw. And the big question was, you know, that head was almost completely devascularized. Did it survive? Well, we had to take the screw out, but we did an arthrogram and it looks like it's doing pretty well. So it revascularized. I showed you the congruous head. Now the complications, what are the complications you need to tell the parents may occur? Stiffness. Right, loss of motion, what else? Pain. Well, the radial head sometimes will overgrow and that will cause some loss of motion. Or it may be a non-union or a vascular necrosis. Now, occasionally if you operate on them, you can get a radial ulnar synostosis. And the big problem is that if you're going to operate on them, you need to operate on them within the first week. If you, if you wait, then you already have a lot of callus, and when you operate, you just kind of uh, make the callus that much more. And if you're very aggressive in your treatment, this was treated by a orthopedic surgeon that I knew that was had pretty heavy hands and was pretty aggressive. And this patient ended up with a radial ulnar synostosis. And the other thing was it was done late. Now, this is you, a lot of them will go to delayed union. Here you can see this one had an open reduction with pin fixation, but it was delayed. And actually, there may even be some avascular necrosis. That may be one reason why it's delayed. But you just wait it out, and eventually it'll fill in. When um, you say aggressive, do you mean he opened it and Yeah, and he, he was, did a lot of dissection and okay. kind of stirred up the callus and so forth. Yes. Now here's, now this one was associated with a dislocation, six weeks post-open reduction, and non-union had persisted. And this patient also has avascular necrosis. Now here's another one. This one had an open reduction and six months post-op. What do you see here? Loss of reduction. Yeah, what else? Heterotopic bone. Oh. Yeah, sometimes that can occur. That's why when you, you say you, you, if you do it late, you can stimulate. The, this one was uh, done and got some heterotopic bone. And so this patient has got some avascular necrosis and heterotopic ossification. Here's another one. This is a 12-year-old. Showed up, showed up in my office, six months post-injury, uh, post-fracture, and it was sent to me by another orthopedic surgeon because of the x-ray. So, what's the next thing you want to do to determine what your treatment is? Determine if she's having any symptoms or how yeah. the range of motion you, is. You mean something like doing a physical exam? <laughs> yeah. Do they still do those? Yeah, they do occasionally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's look at her. Here she has got full supination, full pronation. She's got a little bit increase in her carrying angle, but that doesn't bother her. She's got full flexion and full extension. Can we make her any better? No. 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 So the best bet is leave her alone. So sometimes the clinical examiner will determine what you need to do. Now, so this one was a complication that resulted in a lawsuit. And this one here had an initial injury and had a closed reduction one week. And that looks pretty good. But notice that this head here is completely off. So I saw it this one. And then two weeks later, they lost a reduction. So they went back and did an open reduction. And this was two months following the open reduction. What's your concern here? He's had two insults to that radial head. The, the three, actually, the fracture, 
the closed reduction and the open reduction. It looks like he's developing um, concern for AVN and yeah. his heterotopic ossification. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe at this point that maybe it was just a malreduction and she had lost some motion and the mother was suing the other people. And <clears throat> I thought we could really help her. We got some, lots of CT scans. You can see that fragment is just kind of misshapen and everything. And <clears throat> here you can see this thing is kind of reabsorbed. And she had an established non-union. And we did an open reduction and really there's nothing there. Here you can see we tried to, this is the radial head, we did a retrograde nail, and we used another nail to kind of hold it. And the option now was you really couldn't do it, and so we just took out the head. And they seemed to do fairly well, even at that, they seemed to do very well. So, you can do a salvage radial head resection, but you don't like to do that in a growing child. But that was the only thing and in retrospect, she probably had primary avascular necrosis. Now, a lot of times there's uh, associated soft tissues. This patient felt a pop with swelling and presented to the emergency room with a swollen right elbow, no other apparent injuries. And the, re and the x rays, what do you see here? Some spurring on the. Well, he's got a positive fat pads. Yeah, so you know there's some type of intraarticular injury. What else do you see? It looks like a buckle, yeah, or a spurring of that radial metastasis. Yeah, well, actually what you have here is a fracture of the radial head. And if you look real closely, this one's a little bit posteriorly sublux, not much. So, is that fracture significant? It's in the joint. You bet. It's joint here, and then it's a radial head fracture. That tells you something different, and we'll sh see what happens with radial head fractures. But we don't see this. So, how are you gonna treat this patient? It's in the joint. Um, well, first I'd like to maybe, with advanced imaging, see what I'm working with. Yeah, right. So you're gonna put in a simple sling, put a long arm cast, send for physical therapy, open reduction internal fixation, or you're gonna do stress testing. You wanna see the function. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, that's what done, but she was placed in a long arm splint, and it was two weeks before she could get to the clinic, and so when she came in, she still had elbow pain. Now what's happened? Well, it's posteriorly yes, subluxed, sir. right. Collapsed. So in addition, she now has posterior interosseous nerve paralysis. It's pressing on that. So what would you do now? Now you take Start aggressive off. physical therapy, continue the long arm cast, three more weeks, open reduction of the radial head fracture, or stress test with an arthrogram. She's pressed the envelope, you have to open that up. I think yeah. You know. Well, oh. first thing you want to do is see what's going on. And so under anesthesia, found out that she was unstable. You can see that radial head. Is she unstable because of the radial head? No, the soft tissue is. That's right, very good. Open reduction was performed, and here you go, you got the operative findings. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna fix it, or are you gonna excise it? Uh, it depends on how the size of the, the fragment. Yeah, it's big enough. So, so it was fix fixed it. with trans screws, and here she was six weeks post-op. You can see here, she's gone ahead and healed, and she's got pretty good range of motion. She's got a little loss of of pronation here on the affected side, but she certainly has a functional range of motion. Now the real question was, was is it the radial head fracture that caused the elbow instability, or is there some lateral other soft tissue? And the real key was the radial collateral ligament becomes, uh, becomes that must be reattached. And remember there's a lot of cartilage on the lateral condyle, so there's not a, if the, if the ligament tears, it really doesn't attach very well, as you can see here. So we had to reattach that by scraping it up and, and, and putting some suture there. So fractures of the radial head often have radial collateral ligaments evolved with the lateral epicondyle. And this is pointed out in the literature. Here's an article years ago in, in 2008, and 
they reviewed 333 radial head fractures. A lot of these are in adults, but they found that a fourth of them had associated injuries of the soft tissues. And so the mechanism of, well, the mechanism of radial head fractures usually occurs during a dislocation. And so as it goes posteriorly, it will then pull off the, the lateral collateral ligament. So anytime you have a radial head fracture, you need to, the message here is that you need to always assess the integrity of the lateral ulnar collateral ligaments. And that was the problem with this girl. She had an unstable elbow and she began to sublux. And sublux enough that her posterior interosseous nerve was involved. All right, so so much for radial head fracture, radial neck fractures and radial head. Let's talk about the olecranon. So you need to know a little bit about the ossification pattern. What do you see at birth? You don't have an ossification. That's pattern. right, there's no ossification. At eight years, what do you see? Well, that ossification uh, goes back a bit posterior, but you still don't see much there. And at 12 years, what do you have? A Is this a fracture? Is it fractured here? And sometimes they'll, the patient will have a sore elbow and they'll send him in and say, oh, look, there's a fracture there. There's a secondary ossification Yeah. Center. How many? Two. There's two. two. Okay, and what's this one called? Yeah, this, there's two of them. And this one's called the articular one because it involves the articular surface. And this one involves what? The traction because it involves the other here. So, now, two ways that these fractures can be classified. You can do it geographic by whether it's through the physis or the metaphyseal or mechanistomy, whether it's a flexion injury, extension injury, or a shear injury. And really, the mechanism is probably a little bit more better in the classification detecting your treatment. The characteristic of flexion injuries is what fails. The metaphysis. Oh, yeah, that's right. Fails. It is the metaphysis. But what what would you what would you lose? You'll lose extension. That's right. You lose your extension. Tension. This is a tension failure on the posterior aspect, and you lose your extensor mechanism. And with failure, the extensor mechanism is lost. And so the characteristic on X-rays. What do you see? You see a displaced. Um, that's right. You see separation. The, You've lost your integrity there, and the triceps pulls that proximally, and you lose all ability to, to extend the elbow. What do you see clinically? Uh, clinically, you see a large effusion posteriorly and the uh, inability to extend. Yeah, and in. also you can feel a little gap in there a lot of times. You do this when you get them asleep, but you can feel a little gap in there. There's usually a posterior gap. Now. You can treat them with simple immobilization, or you reestablish the posterior defect with, how do you do this, what's this? Uh, tension band technique. Te tension band technique. So that's so that if you have any flexion, it maintains the integrity of the tension side, essentially. So, when would you do simple immobilization? If it's minimally displaced? Yeah, and, and that's pretty rare, it's minimally displaced. Those are non or minimally displaced fractures and very few of us have been able to treat that but there is if it's just minimally displaced you can consider that in the matter of immobilization you put them in a long arm cast and extension now those with significant displacement what are you going to do oh uh, you need to fix it so yeah. uh, you, well, well, what do you have to accomplish uh, you need to restore that articular surface. Uh, uh, Re-establish the posterior defect. Uh, Re-establish the extensor mechanism. By what principle again? Oh, the tension band? That's right, you use a tension band. So, what are the alternatives of establishing a tension band? What the alternatives? You, yeah, how uh, do you do it? Oh, how do you, well what it does is it um, transforms you know I mean? tension. I know, no, but what are the, what, are, what, what kind of instruments and so forth? Oh, you can use like a cerclage wire. Yeah, okay, for the band one can use wire you can use or PDS suture. Yes, sir. to secure the band, or you can use K-wires and screw. Now, what do you use in adults mostly? Wires. Yeah, use wire and K-wires. So, this is it, is that pretty well reduced? 
You got a little gap in there, but it looks pretty well reduced. What's the problem with this, though? What's they're going to be complaining? Oh, just weeks? the prominence of yeah, the Yeah, yeah, that's right, the prominence. And if you have to take that out, what do you have to do if you got wire there? Oh, you have to open it up to get the... You have to open the whole <laughs> thing up. Yes, you have sir. to make your own, go back to your whole incision and open it up. So it's a very rigid structure, rigid construct, but there's the problems with this is that the pins are prominent, require early motion, and you need the entire incision to open to remove the wire. Now, in the pediatric group, there's another alternative. What can you use? Can you use a rush rod? Uh, you can. Um, you can use a rush rod or what else? Well, you can use a tension band, you can use screws. And if you get bicortical fixation, you put the screws so that you get there just anterior to the coronoid process and it provides better stability. And actually there's been some biomechanical studies and found that, that when you use this fixation with a plus a tension band, it's a little bit stronger than using the bent wire. And the beauty of this is that you don't have any prominence there. You can, you, you tighten this down. And these kids heal very rapidly. So the proximal fragment you over drill to provide compression. And then you fix it with PDS, a large reabsorbable suture, because they'll heal very rapidly. And so it doesn't need to be removed. And I, I've never had to take the screw out on these because it's, it doesn't have any prominence or anything like that. Whereas the others have had to take it out and do it. Do it. And if you have any trouble here, you can do this almost percutaneously by just taking the screw out. So, the characteristic of extension injuries, suppose the elbows forced an extension, where do they fail? On the articular side. That's right. They fail on the articular side because the tension forces are interior, and so they fail on the articular side. But what's character, what, what is very critical in the treatment of this? What's because the posterior nos, the posterior, um, yeah, it's intact. It, you, you don't. That's have right. It's resulting in cortical failure anteriorly, but fortunately the posterior periosteum, or even sometimes the cortex, is still intact. So you still have your extensor mechanism is intact. So, therefore, we can use that posterior cortex as a tension band. And in a typical extension injury, how are you going to reduce it and hold it? Uh, inflection. That's right. Here's one that open, had a gap open like this and had a gap. And so the posterior periosteum was intact. And we were able to close the gap by just putting her in the elbow in flexion non-operatively. You can see it. Now, if it's, <clears throat> if it's somewhat comminuted, you may need to put a couple of screws across that to hold it and went on to heal. Now, there are some shear injuries in which they'll hit it like this, and direct force is applied to the flexed elbow, and then it'll shear it off like this. This is pretty rare. And both the radius and ulna are displaced as a unit, but the periosteum still stays intact. So, how are you going to treat this one? Same way. All you got, here's this patient with a shear injury, and you can see there the fracture fragments, but the periosteum is still intact. And the orthopedic surgeon that treated this one just simply flexed it up. And here you can see the periosteum. There's the fracture, and that's where the periosteal callus was formed. So, extension injuries, a lot of times they're green stick displacement fractures. What do you need to look for? Uh, the ulna and associated. Yeah, the ulna and what's there? Uh, the radial neck. Yeah, right. They can either be, if they're valgus angulation, often you'll have the medial epicondyles off and the radial neck is hit. And if it is a varus angulation, you have a radial head dislocation and what kind of injury is this? Uh, Ontasia three injury. Okay, and the fracture patterns caused. So the treatment with green stick varus and valgus, you correct the deformity and extension and you treat the associated injury, whether it's radial neck or the medial epicondyle or the radial head dislocation. Now, another problem with electron fractures fell in the monkey bars. 
Everything was intact, like pronation to neutral by 20 degrees, had full supination. Took three weeks to get an appointment, and this is the presenting x-rays. What do you see? I see proximal ulna. Yeah, that's I right. You're, you you need to focus on the ulna again. So, here's the forearm image. You always get forearm images of it. And so is that acceptable? Not really. So, first thing you wanted to determine is how about the arthrogram to check the congruity. And when it's in full pronation, it's like this. So you reduce the ulna and put it in supination. And so then you need to reduce and stabilize the ulna. It had plastic deformation. You stabilize it with a retrograde nail. And now you can see that you've got a good reduction of your radial head. So if the green stick ulna deformity persists, like in this patient, it wasn't recognized. And remember that green stick ulnas have a tendency to go late displacement and lateral displacement. So if that persists, radiocapitular joint becomes incongruent. And what's the patient going to start to complain about? Loss of range of motion. And, and yeah, it's going to be painful because it's an incongruous joint. So how are you going to, what do you have to treat? Uh, you just first treat the ulna and then address the radial head dislocation. Yeah, well, yeah, actually what it was was a late osteotomy. And once we did the late osteotomy, it actually could So the message here is that you need to be aware of the occult olecranon fractures. It may be a type three Montasia lesion, and this could produce radial capitellar incongruity. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. You did well. Thanks.